All right, welcome everyone to United by Water with a Q&A session at the end. This event is a part of Bellevue College's Earth Week, where we are exploring topics around the theme, the future is now, which strives for a just and sustainable future for all. You can see our full schedule of events by visiting the link in the chat box at bellevuecollege.edu slash sustainability. My name is Theo and I am from the Office of Sustainability and I will be moderating this event. Before we get started, we have some things to go over. You are muted on joining and we would like for you to stay on mute unless actively asking a question or responding to a prompt from the speaker. If you would like to keep your camera on, it makes for a more engaging session for everyone. This event is also being recorded to post on our sustainability webpage. Throughout the session, please treat everyone with respect and share your comments and questions in the chat box. Uh, we will open up for Q&A at the end where you can either unmute yourself or have us read out your question. For the best Zoom experience, click the view button in the top right corner of the screen, which will make sure the, sh the speaker is centered on your screen. Lastly, we pause to acknowledge that Bellevue College resides on the traditional and occupied land of the Coast Salish peoples, past, present, and future. That includes, but is not limited to, Snoqualmie, Suquamish, Duwamish, Nisqually, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot. We honor their connection to the region, pay respect to Coast Salish leaders past and present and stand in solidarity through their struggles with continued systemic oppression. We commit to care for the land and water and center equity at the core of our learning. Now, let me take a moment to introduce Derek, our speaker. Derek Lemaire is a Native American filmmaker from Spokane, Washington, by way of the Colville Indian Reservation. And I'll let him uh, take it away and give a little bit of background on himself. Hi, everybody. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, thank you for the invite, Bellevue. Uh, my name is Derek Lemire. I'm a uh, filmmaker from out of Spokane, Washington. And I am the director of United by Water. Um, we started United by Water in 2016 when the uh, Upper Columbia United Tribes uh, was donated six uh, old growth cedar logs from the territory you're actually residing in right now, which is pretty cool. And uh, we did that in order to return to the water for the first time in almost 80 years. At the time, it had been 80 years since uh, we could see Kettle Falls, which Kettle Falls is where our uh, salmon fishery was. So we kind of just wanted to return the water, do this big, big project, which is build these hand dugout canoes, which you guys might see quite a bit of out there. They have a lot of, uh, you know, their canoe culture uh, revitalization is, you know, like 20 or 30 years ahead of ours, but uh, we kind of follow in their path and returning to the water and showing people that we uh, still use this water to this day, especially for cultural practices. Uh, since then, this film's been you know, shown everywhere. It's kind of brought me a lot of places and. Uh, brought me new opportunities, including this one right now. So I'm very happy uh, to be able to share this with you guys and to uh, continue on on that path of just sharing our culture and um, you know showing people that we still you know we still practice these things uh, to this day. So thank you. All right. Uh, should we get the movie started or? Yeah. Sounds good. Hi, everyone. I am Amy McCrory, and I am the advisor for the First Nations Club. So we are open for questions if you have questions for Derek. All right, Derek, I don't know if anybody's got questions yet, but I have a question for you out of curiosity. Um, I know that this was a journey made once. Do they try and do this every year or is this kind of like an, a more special occasion kind of thing? Uh, 
Uh, that one in particular was the first year that they had done it, especially with their uh, hand, dug, hand dug out canoes. Uh, every year since they've done some version of it that always ends at Kettle Falls. Uh, the second year they all journeyed together, but that was the first time that they all went from their traditional homelands to there. They're going back to that format this year, as far as I understand, you know, knock on wood that we're all able to do that safely um, with COVID and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, they've, they've tried to do a version of that, you know, river canoe journey every year uh, during the, the summer solstice. The solstice. I don't know if it's summer solstice. With the title of that, June but. Yeah, yeah, the 21st of June, I believe. Okay. And then are these the only tribes that are currently involved or are other tribes trying to get kind of in on it as well? Yeah, we've uh, expanded out. Uh, I know that we've had uh, a couple of different communities that have um, started doing their own uh, cedar dugout or pine logs and have uh, made canoes. It's usually uh, the upper Columbia tribes or those sister tribes, but we have invites out for everyone. And um, unfortunately it kind of conflicts with a lot of, uh, you know, the powwow schedule and other canoe journeys that are going on. Um, we have a lot of different, uh, ever since then, that was like the first of the upper Columbia. And ever since then, they've taken some of those canoes everywhere, you know, different powwows for presentations, uh, just journeys from uh, like Nimipu has built, I want to say, dang near a fleet of them uh, since. But uh, yeah, so we, we've had the invite out. I've actually last summer, of course, right before or uh, last uh, fall, right before COVID, when we premiered my recent documentary, Older Than the Crown, uh, my family had purchased and commissioned a canoe. We were going to do that this past year, but of course, with everything, we didn't get to do that. But um, this coming year, we have, um, I think in 2020, they had acquired like 12 logs uh, in the community. So a lot of family canoes and things like that. So hopefully this year will be, you know, a big return to the river anyway. Now, I know in the documentary, they said that the original logs came from the Quinault. Are all the trees coming from the Quinault area or is it just kind of all over the place? Uh, those original ones were all from Quinault. Uh, there's two other ones that weren't in the documentary that ended up being made into um, canoes as well. But at that time, it was one of uh, the last bit of this old growth area in the Quinault territory. Um, so we got these just, you know, 30 something foot logs, 30,000 pounds, like huge canoes or huge uh, logs at that time. Uh, since then, we've acquired them through different um, forestry companies, if I remember right. But that's where the recent 12 came from. Um, of course, as you know, a lot of the West Coast of Washington, as they know, like those things are becoming more and more rare to where those those logs we we're very fortunate that they donated them at cost where if you were to purchase one privately, it would be anywhere between 14 and $20,000 a log. So we were very lucky at that time to, you know, get that log. Um, you know, it's just, it's just very rare that you get a log like that, especially six of them that are, you know, I don't want to say worthy or quality wise, like, uh, you know, worthy of being made into a 30 foot canoe, but, um, yeah, at that time, it was just all through the Quinault uh, Indian Reservation area. Um, is there anything you want folks to kind of take away from the documentary? You know, I've, I've kind of changed my view on it. At first, I wanted to, you know, just show that, hey, we're returning to the water, but it means so much more. Um, at the time when I first started this documentary, um, I knew the canoe stuff was going on, but I didn't know the big scale of, you know, that project. So I was kind of just trying to be a fly on the wall. I was kind of recovering from post concussion syndrome. I had a, you know, two concussions in, you know, the span of 12 months. So I was just kind of doing whatever I was inspired by John and uh, John really got me out of uh, my shell at the time. And uh, I was able to travel and uh, you know, be inspired by John's work ethic. If you ever get a chance to meet John Zinzer, he lives in the Olympia area, but he does canoes all throughout that area as well, or works with the communities. But 
Uh, he's one of the most inspiring people by his work ethic. And then I think that he inspired a lot of people to get back into canoe making. Uh, I mean, all throughout these, you know, we did six canoes, but they did them in a span of 12 months. So for someone like that, to inspire that many people, especially when we hadn't had canoes in over, you know, 80 plus years, I want to say it was closer to 100 years. So for me, it's just, I want this to be more of an inspiring story. It's not just, you know, I don't, I, there's just so many different meanings and this thing's kind of grown past, you know, what my intentions of the film were. Like, I just wanted to kind of document and do this kind of adventure documentary, but it really like included or got me back into our culture, got me back into working with people in this area. Um, gosh, sorry, I, I went on a tangent there, but- It's all good. Uh, it's all good. Yeah, I, um, you know, I was really inspired by, you know, like I said, the way these guys work and, you know, without having that past experience outside of John is pretty, pretty wild that they made these, uh, made these um, canoes in that short amount of time that still have since then has had this ripple effect to where now everyone's building their own, they have their own paddles, we do this canoe journey where before, you know, we didn't even have safety training and things like that that first year. Um, I was lucky enough about 10 months into the project, uh, the people that had, uh, acquired the log upper Columbia United tribes, uh, we had known of each other and had talked about doing a documentary. And then about 10 months in, when I started sharing the, sharing the videos and things like that, like they came back around and they were like, I think this would be a really, uh, good opportunity to just inspire people, not just by these small videos, but maybe do a full documentary. So we teamed up about uh, 10 months to a year into it. And, you know, as you can tell in the film, a lot of that I spent with my people, the people of the, uh, the Colville Confederated tribes and uh, working with Yukut, you know, they represent uh, a lot of the upper Columbia tribes and other interests, but uh, they really inspired me to get to know a lot more of our sister tribes. So, you know, it'd been the first time in quite a while because, you know, as things go on, uh, tribes get different motivations. You know, of course we have businesses and things like that that conflict with each other, but this was one thing that really was just a, a really cool pure movement um, about getting back on the water, um, praying for the salmon as a unit now, um, where before we had a lot of separate um, ceremonies and things like that, but now we have this big central one, which was really inspiring. And it was really awesome to see everyone kind of put aside their own little, um, I don't want to say squabbles, but, you know, differences, I suppose, to realize that we're all kind of the same. And, you know, we were once on that water uh, before the uh, Grand Coulee Dam, you know, flooded the area. Now, I know uh, folks kind of speak to it in the documentary, but you kind of also made a comment in passing about the spiritual effect that this whole thing had on people. Can you kind of go in and let folks know, you know, some of the comments that you heard off camera about how much this affected people and just kind of how they viewed themselves, the tribe and their traditions afterwards? Yeah, um, you know, we hadn't done that. We hadn't got back to being a community at large. You know, of course, we've had our own, you know, like I said, with the powwows and things like that. But I felt like in this area, we really needed to come together and have some sort of joint ceremony. And at the time, um, myself included, there's a lot of pessimism or maybe like, hey, this is going to be one off thing. And, you know, hopefully people will use these things and don't end up in like a museum. You know, not that there's anything wrong with that, but we want these things to be used. Um, as that thing went on, uh, the thing as in the creation of the, the canoes and also getting back on the water, um, you know, you saw a change in people that that is a part of their lives. It's not just a recreation. This is part of their ceremonies. Uh, Patty Porter, that's in that film. Uh, she talks a lot at the end about returning back to the water. She was grieving at the time. And I have, I have the right to, or I've been given permission to kind of tell a little bit of these stories. So I'll tell you a little bit about Patty, but she was grieving the loss of her husband and uh, just wanted to be a part of something. She didn't even want to be on the canoe she just wanted to be a support staff and towards the end we're like you know you're a part of this as much as we are and we were able to get her on there so things like that to help them process you know parts of their lives that's what these things are for um 
you kind of hear from my cousin Ben and my cousin Travis, those two, um, we grew up together, of course, where, you know, we went through a lot as a family. We had a lot of loss during that time. Uh, he spoke of our great, great grandmother who was born on that mountaintop. Uh, my grandmother, you know, that's where they had ceremonies like their um, coming of age. Uh, I don't want to say puberty rights, but the coming of age, they would go up there and do these ceremonies before the flooding. So it was kind of really impactful for us, like, you know, with all the distractions we have in our lives at the time, you know, our cousins, a lot of our family was going through drug and alcohol um, issues, uh, been included. Um, but we went through something like that, that wasn't as not just like a physical exercise, but just like an exercise of the spirit. And, uh, you know, he was able to overcome those things. He's you know, five or six years sober now, or five years sober since then. Um, Travis, who speaks about um, Whitestone, me and him at the time um, hadn't spoken seven years. <laughs> you know, we had our own personal struggles as young men, and uh, we didn't know how to break the ice. We didn't know how to talk to each other as, you know, hard-headed males. And uh, it was simply like we got on this canoe, and, you know, you got to trust everybody on there safely, you know, and it was simply as like, can you hand me that? We never spoke of our issues. We just had our own healing process. And I really believe in that, having experienced that. So um, since then, we've just tried to support them. Um, you know, currently we're working on a canoe at the Salish School of Spokane here. It's an immersion school. Um, I'm a part of the board of the River Warrior Society, which helps manage all of those canoe journeys. Um, but it's you know, it's totally changed my life in particular, and I can see that in the film, but also just knowing these people, these are now my lifelong friends or family, or I consider them family. So um, it's a profound effect. And um, like I said, we try to learn from the West Coast tribes, you know, the Quinault, the Nisqually. Um, they've had that canoe journey for since 1989, you know, and they had their similar story where it had been almost 100 years. I did a documentary called The Seventh Wave, and that was my first introduction to that whole culture. And then when these things came together, we tried to model it after them because they're obviously in a very good spot. And we could see how their communities have healed in different ways, uh, totally based on these uh, ceremonies. So um, we have we have uh, good teachers, I suppose, with uh, with all those tribes out there. So we try to model off that and we've seen the fruits of our labor and uh, their teachings. Um, it looks like we've got a comment in the chat. Are the paddles and other materials usually made from cedar as well? Uh, in that instance, yes. Uh, we had a lot of the, the cedar beams and um, cuts that we had that we made into, uh, into paddles and different tools, like carving tools. Like there's you know different parts of the log that you can use to uh, build tools to do your hand dugout canoe. Uh, since then, we've, we have a lot of pine out here. So they've done like, you know, all sorts of different wood. We're kind of learning because cedar is the lightest. It's uh, the easiest to take care of because it doesn't necessarily rot. Um, we learned that the hard way after like, you know, of course, all those guys told us like cedar's the best. And then we started doing poplar and all these others where they're just incredibly heavy uh, uh, paddles and things like that. When you get 80 miles in, your arm feels like it's falling off. But uh, yeah, um, ideally, cedar is the one that you want to make something with. All right. Looks like we got another question. Do you know what the status of the salmon are now or any progress to restore their population. The story yeah. of walking across a river on salmon was powerful to convey yeah. how abundant they once were. Right. And that's that's a not an exaggeration. Like you see some of these photos. If you look up loc.gov, that's Library of Congress, you can look up some of these giant salmon that they used to pull out of. And of course there's you know Jesuit diaries and uh, journals from different discoverers like David Thompson and things like that that talk about that. Um, since 1940, you know, we didn't really, I don't want to say we didn't notice, like it was told to us, but it wasn't made, you know, in the forefront that we'd lose all of them. They're virtually extinct. Uh, since then with, um, you know, our own uh, cultural revitalization, we have salmon farms, things like that, like a lot of the tribes on the West Coast do as well. Um, 
we've slowly reintroduced salmon through, I want to say the Okanagan and the San Poil, where they have their own kind of um, ways north and things like that. So we've seen the reintroduction on those fronts, but the Columbia River, it's exceptionally difficult, not only because, you know, we have a series of dams, the Grand Coulee was the first of those, but uh, we have a series of dams that block their way up to, you know, the Arrow Lakes. Um, we've uh, ventured out and done like this past year, they did a, what they call a salmon cannon, which they have like a barge that has a pump that, you know, these salmon are put through this tube and then more or less like shot through a tube over a dam. So we're, we're showing these governments and they don't do these just out of like circus tricks or anything like that, but we do these, uh, do these things to show like this is possible to bring these things back. Um, they've been in constant negotiation with the Grand Coulee Dam or Bonneville Power Administration that runs these uh, in constant negotiation about uh, building a salmon ladder or some sort of mechanism to get the salmon over the Grand Coulee Dam. Grand Coulee Dam is like 500 feet tall, so it's a huge dam and it's a huge infrastructure plan that the tribe is ready to do on their own but of course they need the you know participation of you know the bpa in order to do this so we're working on things like that in our um my recent film older than the crown we uh documented us reintroducing salmon above those dams kind of symbolically showing that you know these these things are these uh fish deserve to return back to the water just like us. So um, we have some really beautiful footage and really beautiful speeches of, uh, you know, these efforts that we're working on. So hopefully um, with that in the Columbia River Treaty that's being negotiated, uh, the tribes will have some sort of uh, say in the future, because these are things that we need to reintroduce. Um, not, not just because of, you know, our cultural um, aspects, but just the ecology and biology of the rivers like and these help the these help the uh sorry <laughs> uh these help the uh you know the other animals that uh you know live along these rivers um we're also battling issues like tech Cominco, which is a, a chemical and mineral company in canada that's been poisoning the water from the very upper reaches of the columbia so it's been running down and poisoning places like black sand beach all the way down onto our reservation where there's you know, of course, a rise in cancer and um, the fish that are there are, um, they're not safe to eat. You can't drink out of the Columbia, of course, you know, not just population, but it's because of things like them or places or companies like them that are poisoning the water and that got away with it for over 100 years. So it's all, it's not just one battle. It's, you know, 100 battles at once, but, you know, we're slowly making progress and we're hopeful that, you know, hopefully in the near future, we'll have some sort of plan to you know, get to step one. Awesome. All right, it looks like we got a couple more questions. Uh, first one is the film talked about confrontations with people along the journey, the birthday party scene. Yeah. Did you have any confrontations from state or federal government? How can people support current and future journeys and ceremonies, or is there something specific you want people to know about them? Uh, that That birthday scene was kind of wild that I was there and Travis is speaking. And of course we had to do a lot of editing because it's, you know, it still brings up a lot of anger in the way in which we were treated. And uh, the version he tells is very censored, but we were, it's a paddle in only um, spot that was, you know, reserved with the national park service. We had, you know, the police with us, all these different agents and um, they watched this happen to us. So, you know, what do you do? you know, us being, you know, meatheads, we we're ready to, you know, represent what we were doing and fight for it. But at the same time, like, that's not the answer. So um, we moved across the river and camped and kept our head high. Um, those are the things that happen all the time. Um, there's stories with fish and wildlife and, um, you know, the tribal resources that, you know, go into trying to you know, hopefully prevent those things or create some education. And of course, we just get met with a lot of ignorance. Um, the federal government, like I said before, um, and the police, we had police boats and things like that occasionally throughout our trip, but we worked hand in hand with the National Park Service. And we're very thankful that, you know, they're partners with us in the upper Columbia, uh, along where the reservations are, uh, the tribes manage half the river. So the other half is ran by the National Park Service. So we work hand in hand with them 
and they've been uh, really great supporters of ours. Um, we're very lucky that that relationship is is really good because I, you know, in other places it's not so not so great, but um, we're very lucky to work with them hand in hand, and we see them as partners in this this growth of the canoe culture. All right. Another question is: Are the residents of Kettle Falls supported of supportive of the commute journey? Yeah, yeah. Um, surprisingly, yes. I think it. A lot of it was um, just the knowledge wasn't there. They didn't. I mean, we have visitor centers, or we, as in the community, there has visitor centers that kind of, you know, as most museums do, they're like there was Native Americans here, but. This was the first time that they saw us come back in a very long time or, um, you know, done that kind of thing. So uh, the community has been very supportive. They've asked for more information. This film in particular, not to pat myself on the back or, you know, always talk about this film, but this film has been really impactful to, you know, put in places like that or make available for free, which we've done with our DVDs, um, with our film festivals and the success of this that we promote in those areas saying like, you know, look at us, this is, you know, our culture in action. And it's really inspired a lot of people to support it. Um, we've had different people join us on the canoe journey. You know, we don't make any rules as far as like what kind of canoes or what race or anything like that. It's very inclusive. Um, so we've got, you know, a really great amount of support, even with some of the, <laughs> we have, you know, kind of crazy federalist people out here along the river. And surprisingly, like, they've been really supportive and, you know, have helped us and guided us through, you know, because you know, we have, you know, some crazy eddies and things like that. So it's, you know, it's pretty inspiring <laughs> considering the, some of the people that come and support us, but we're, you know, we're very lucky. I, like I said, I think um, doing that and doing this film and, you know, the constant promotion we do um, has really helped that relationship. All right. Uh, someone had a question about how long was the farthest trip distance and or days? Uh, the farthest trip was uh, with us, the Nespelum crew that left from Grand Coulee Dam. Uh, it's 115 linear miles, but, you know, of course, you're crossing, doing this, dodging, you know, um, boats and things like that. So it was quite a bit more, but 115 miles upriver, which <laughs> they've done once since, but, you know, it's that trip has changed a bit, so it's a little bit easier to do. But uh, that year was like the big adventure. Nobody had done that in quite some time. And um, the tribes were in, as another story, the tribes were in negotiation about uh, the water flow from Kinleyside Dam. And, you know, when they get in those kind of arguments, they'll raise the water or lower the water, send a bunch of crap down the river. And at that time, they're in these kind of very tent, uh, you know, very tense negotiations. And they opened up the dam. So we were like dodging, you know, branches, logs, just garbage from, you know, hate to blame it all on Canada, because I'm sure it's some of ours too. But, you know, they sent from their from their dams down. So it was kind of a is a interesting situation it made for a crazier adventure. All right, someone had a question on why hadn't there been a canoe in close to 100 years? Well, um, the Columbia River at the time, you look at it now, I'm not sure how familiar people are. Um, right now, it's a very recreation heavy river to where the water is calm enough to have boats and things like that, wave runners, you know, there's swimming areas where at the time it, it was a wild river. There was no dams to control that water flow. So the type of canoes we had were either surgeon nose canoes, which you see at that, you know, in the film, but also hand dugout canoes, which were the longer wooden boats that we had. Um, they lasted a long time. It wasn't, you know, we didn't have just constant canoe uh, production. We'd send them down the river to our families and somehow get them back up, things like that. And uh, not to mention industrialization of the upper Columbia happened really, really early. Uh, with David Thompson and I want to say the Spanish and also the Russian communities and uh, Hudson Bay companies, they, uh, you know, more or less managed a lot of the water, or a lot of the, um, the flow through there. So, you know, we couldn't safely, you know, harvest in our community. That's kind of what our, 
our other documentaries about is just the the crazy history of you know Canada with the Sinaiks people. But um, I think it just had to do with industrialization and us being pushed farther and farther away from the river. You know, it started with uh, the Sinaiks being pushed closer and closer to the U.S. And then once they got them past uh, the U.S. border, they declared them extinct. And then we had the north half, which, you know, was all of uh, like Kettle Falls and things like that. We had this whole open area, Stevens County, like the majority of it was, you know, Colville Confederated, you know, tribes uh, reservation land. And then once they started getting more and more resources up here, they cut off the north half from us. And now we're in the reservation currently where we're at. So it's a lot of industrialization and a lot of um, threat, you know, threat to Native people and their communities out here. We had to learn how to survive in different ways. And unfortunately, one of the casualties was, you know, our canoe culture. Um, I know there was a lot of talk in the documentary about the effect that the canoes on this journey had on uh, a lot of the adults that were involved in the process. My question to you is, how did a lot of the, the teenagers and the kids react to uh, the canoes being built and carved? Uh, a lot of these communities, uh, they have mixed use areas. So they'd be able to have the high schools go out there and help do the heavy work, you know? So they were, um, the youth were hand in hand with this, uh, the canoe building. Of course, when it got to the finer stuff and when you're, you know, starting to swing blades around more and off, more often, they, uh, you know, went back to the, the adults, but uh, they worked hand in hand with us. Uh, we had um, each uh, community had management of their own paddlers. So we always tried to cycle in the youth. Um, yeah, we just, we just had, you know, we worked hand in hand with them. They, they were as much part of the team as the adults, um, especially with uh, Virgil Seymour, his his grandkids, nieces and nephews, after, when he passed away, it was really important for us to get them on that canoe that was named after him. Uh, so yeah, they, you know, it's wasn't shown so much in the film just because of, um, you know, having to track down kids and interview kids is always super difficult. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're very proud of uh, the reach we were have, the reach that we had with the high school students and kids younger than that. Uh, does anyone have more questions for Derek? Oh, there you go. What are some educational resources that people can look to continue learning about Columbia River and the co Coastal Salish tribes in history? Uh, there's a lot of nonprofits coming up that are um, working with schools and districts uh, to create curriculums. Um, I would say interiorsalish.com. That's one of uh, the resources that we use for language. Um, the River Warrior Society that I just joined, I'm part of their group, their nonprofit. Um, we're constantly trying to share canoe culture and learn a better way um, to get the word out outside of just passing out flyers. So we're learning a lot about social media. We're, you know, of course, sharing a lot of stories that we learn from our elders. Um, you know, a lot of that stuff's on Facebook, like they have a big community, a uh, couple thousand people on River Warriors. I think if you just type it up, you'll, you'll see a big cedar canoe. Um, and we're working hand in hand with a lot of historical societies. Um, I can't think of the ones on the West Coast of Washington, but uh, some of the ones like the Kettle Falls Historic Society, um, the Selkirk, uh, which is um, above the border, but in the uh, Arrow Lakes, Upper Columbia area. Uh, we work with them with our last documentary and um, we share this, share this documentary as much as we can. We're in talks of putting this on PBS, but at the time the, the deal wasn't right. So we just figured we'd make our own DVDs and that thing's been pretty successful. We've, you know, been able to show it all over the world. Um, you know, got to watch it with like Bill Gates and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, just share, share documentaries, um, reach out. Like a lot of these tribes are, um, like myself and like the river warriors are getting really into social media and how to promote those issues through there, or at least pose the question or 
um, provide some sort of resource socially, which is you know, not something that we ever focused on or knew that that was a tool for us to use where now we're kind of getting a lot better about it. Do you folks have any other questions for Derek? All right, I figured I'll give it a sec to see if any other questions pop up. Um, is there anything you would like to tell us in closing, Derek? I'd just like to thank everybody for their time. Um, you know, the world right now, there's so many things going on, especially being stuck at home. And uh, I really appreciate the time you spent to learn about, you know, the people of the Upper Columbia area, canoe culture. Um, yeah, I just really appreciate that time because I know that, you know, er, there's so much time. <laughs> only so much time to spend with people. And I really appreciate this time in the middle of a day. Um, yeah, please just share this film. If you need a link, you know, of course we can organize that because I believe we, we had a registration. So if anybody needs a link and would like to watch that over again, please do. Um, I'm available all on social media and you can find my emails on our website, which is warponypictures.com. Uh, we're pretty open with sharing our films. Um, our newest film, Older Than the Crown, we just signed a deal this past summer to uh, get that on PBS for the next four years. So we're currently updating that film and uh, it's about the case of Rick Dizitel. So we're waiting on the, uh, the status, the final status of that case, but that should be on late 2021 or uh, 2022. And um, that thing's also been pretty impactful. So look out for that. And yeah, just thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Derek. And thank you for joining us today. Yeah, um, yes. I don't think we have any more questions, so I will let you run off and do what you need to do. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. You guys have a great day or have a great week. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. I uh, just want a few closing comments. Uh, Hope you all learned something new today. I know I did. Uh, and I just want to remind you to the attendees to check out the rest of our Earth Week activities at bellevuecollege.edu slash sustainability. Uh, this event's recording will also be posted there next week. So if you wanted to go back and take a look, we'll have a recording there. Uh, so that, again, thanks for coming and we hope to see you at more Earth Week events. <laughs>